Are you recording? Okay. Um, so hi everyone, welcome to um, this uh, special uh, joint seminar hosted between One World Minds for People Online and uh, CMSE for People in Person. Um, today we are pleased to have Felix Kramer, who is a professor at TUM, uh, the Technical University of Munich. And he's here to talk about uh, robustness guarantees for low rent matrix recovery with adversarial noise. So um, Felix, if you're ready, um, please take it away. Thanks a lot. I, I don't know it's the camera. Oh, it's here. Yeah, shoot. Um, let's see. Let's see. Let's just make sure. Um, let me turn this a bit. Actually, this will be Yeah. It's fine. Sorry. We managed to uh, also use the mouse here. Yeah, if you want to like minimize and in 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 the virtual audience. This thanks uh Santos for the nice introduction. Thanks uh, also to Mark and Longzhu for uh, the invitation to, to speak here as a, sort of one of the previous organizers. The topic that I would like to talk to you about is um, a long standing topic in some sense. People have been looking at this problem for uh, a long time. It's about a uh, low rank matrix. Completion. I don't know why. Um, we have to click back on the. Yes, that's, that's how it works. So I should mention that this is joint work with um, my master's student, Julia, who I should add here is no longer at TU Munich, but she's now pursuing a PhD at ETH Zurich. And my PhD graduate, Dominic Stöger, who is, I think, also in the audience. I see his face here. But, um, is now a tenure track professor at the Catholic University of Eichstätt English. So I think many of you know this problem very well, because at least those of you who have been in the working in the area for a longer time, because this is something that uh, was creating a lot of attention about 15 years ago, because um, it was motivated at the time by the so-called Netflix problem. So Netflix put out the data, the parts of the database, and they said uh, predict. I had some ratings of movies, and it says predict the missing entries of the entries. So I, I guess what they did is they wanted to have a recommendation system to saying like this is probably a movie you like, and uh, of course um, you cannot measure the quality of predicting unknown entries. So what they did is they just took their huge database, and they were hiding a few entries, and then asking people to provide algorithms to complete these missing entries in there. Were, then they were finding out how well this worked. And then, uh, of course, this generated a lot of attention in the um, more applied collaborative filtering community where people use the hybrid of many different approaches to, to find a really good method that, that, that takes everything into account and is well adapted to this particular problem. But it also generated attention in the more uh, math-oriented community uh, because it has a very nice, simplified version to it. Namely, one of the key observations that is playing a role here is that this big database of movies and ratings that they have is, a, is observed to be approximately low rank. So if you just take this assumption, which is of course just one of many different factors that need to be taken into account, then the problem becomes like this. You have a low rank matrix where one of the dimensions is corresponding to this different viewers, 
and one of the dimensions corresponding to the different movies. And you want to complete this matrix from the observed entries, basically the movies that have already been watched. Of course, now we are making another simplifying assumption, namely we're assuming that the movies that have been observed are selected. Arguably, this is not the case because in the end, you will be following the recommendation scheme that's given out by Netflix. So you will not just pile up a number of random movies selected from the database. Some of them you will like and some of you will absolutely hate, uh, but you will already have a bias in the first place. But that's again, we are having two sides of the community, the, the, what you sort of want to work and then sort of looking at the theoretical approach to a simplified version of this problem. So that um, we can actually prove some things about it. And I think what we prove and what is proved and done here is actually entering the mod the hybrid model that is used in practice then as one of many components. Um, there are other applications that have similar models, say if you have a global positioning system and you're looking at the pairwise distances, then you can also say that there is naturally a lowering structure because the things are sitting on a two, like if you simplifying that they're sitting in a two dimensional planes. And then, of course, the pairwise distances cannot be chosen arbitrarily, but they also give us to some lowering structure. But then there are many more problems where this arises. In this talk here, I would like to focus on the very first one because it's also very nice mathematically. You have a matrix and you observe it. So, what we can formulate this how do we recover the low rank from truth matrix X naught from a set of randomly sampled Or, if you turn it around, you can give given sample entries. So, we will, we will denote this. A is operation of taking a matrix X naught and just restricting it to a random set of entries. What's the lowest rank matrix between these matrices? So first of all, we should say a caveat. I think that is something that is true in many of these and related problems. If you want to solve this in general, it's not a good idea. You are you're lost because in general, this problem is in E hard. So in some sense, what you can say, there are some observation schemes where it's very difficult to find the completing So you can you can find arrangement of these movies, how they're selected, such that this is hard. But um, here we're not looking at arbitrary selections of the entries, but we're looking at random selections. So that's the hope is that things behave a little bit better. This was um first uh, was studied in a number of papers that I will review at the viewpoints of this first paper giving mathematical theory to this um, problem was based on the so-called nuclear norm minimization. The nuclear norm is what I've been, not been noting by X star. And what we see is that if you minimize X star under these measurement constraints, that's the, the nuclear norm, then we um, have a chance of approaching lowering solutions. So let me first say what is X star? X star is the sum of the singular values. And so then for those of you who haven't seen this, but maybe have seen um, the lasso or L1 minimization in, in the context of sparse recovery, why this is a useful or an, a, 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 seems like a sensible idea. The reason is, if you think about um, what, if you think about the singular value decomposition, what does it mean if a matrix is low rank? Basically, means that there are just few non-zero uh, singular values. Or if you're looking at the singular value decomposition with just square matrices, then it means that on this diagonal matrix there are a lot of zeros on the. And so, if you know, basically, you say that this vector that has, is listing all the n singular values, only r of them are non-zero, or in other words, this vector is sparse. 
And that's why you can, the, the motivation is let's relax in the exact same way. If you had a S sparsity, you came up with the L1 norm as the convex relaxation. Here we're having that the singular values are sparse. So the natural relaxation is the L1 norm of the vector singular. Value. And um, we will see in a second that this is indeed a good idea in many respects, but we can, should first say that it's not always a good idea. Namely, um, if you look at this low rank matrix here with just a one, one, and otherwise zeros, sampling it at random with zeros um, gives you um, just like very likely just zero entries. And then of course, at the same time, if you're thinking about the relaxation, then we're doing well, because the, if we observe, observe a number of zero entries, I'm asking what's the matrix of the lowest rank that completes these zeros, and this will be the zero matrix. And this is exactly what by low rank, what my nuclear norm uh, relaxation gives. But in general, of course, we are not interested in finding the lowering solution. We are one, interested in finding, solving these problems. So we have to take this into account. So um, and that's why we need some additional conditions to actually have a hope of reconstructing these. This additional condition of one way, I mean, maybe others, is to, um, to formulate these incoherence parameters. So the incoherence, you can really look here what it is. So if you're, you're looking at the singular value decomposition, and um, you and you start, and then you're multiplying these matrices, these left and right singular vector matrices to the standard basis, and asking that the resulting uh, vectors that we get have an L2 norm that is not too large. And if you, uh, in other words, what you're asking is that the singular vectors, they are somehow spreading nicely over the different entries. And that is for, uh, that is really preventing just what we have seen because that everything was, uh, captured in just a single entry. So now this is the way to avoid that something like this happens. So things are spreading the same in the different directions. So, and like this is sort of looking at the rows of the columns of these singular vectors. And there were some, some earlier works also had some additional conditions about the actual size of the entries, but then there was some so, okay. that said. What can we now say about the recovery of incoherent matrices? Be a little bit more formal and come back to the model that we have looked at. Then we had an IID sampling scheme. So we're assuming this uh, maybe possibly unlikely uh, model that people are watching movies at random and then giving a rating to them. And this would be, as it's given here, um, use just Every movie session is drawing a user at random and a movie at random, pairing them, observing the result. So in, in other words, what we get is a sampling operator of um, the type that it's getting here. You're pulling out the entry at the position at, at JK, IK, JK, and sort of placing it in that respective, in the kth entry of your sort of measurement vector. And you having an additional rescaling factor squared of n1, n2 divided by m. This is because we want to ensure that the norm of the, is that, that if we're thinking about uh, sort of adding noise to it or something like this, everything should be the same scaling. So that's this normalization set expectation, the vector of measurements is the same size as the matrix, which means that we're blowing up, we have fewer entries, but we're blowing them. Now we are minimizing the nuclear norm 
we're taking this AX equals to Y, it's just saying among all the matrices that agree with our measurements, we take the one that is the same. Yeah. Before I, I review the results, are there any questions regarding the setup? So um, the question in, in this example is why are we looking at the, so it's first motivated, but we can ask the question, why is it the case that this, this matrix of uh, movies and observations are low rank? I mean, this is uh, coming from the applications, and I think that that is, first of all, you can just study the database and observe it somehow. And I think the, the model assumption is, or well, not the assumption, but the observation is that, that there's a very few underlying factors that determine sort of the viewer profile. Somehow these factors interact in a linear way. And that's why um, this is a useful model. I think there's papers who have just studied this on data sets and the, the question of why I mean, this is, I would say these are a posteriori explanations, right? You maybe have an idea that this could be the case that if you have a linear model uh, with just few factors that, that is somehow explaining this low rank thing, then you go and take a data set and you test it. And, and it seems to have worked fairly well. And that's, that's sort of what motivated uh, studying this problem. At the same time, as I said, this is just one of the ingredients that enter sort of the truly competitive algorithms um, to solve it. So uh, that is, um, that's one that it's, it only captures the reality to some extent. At the same time, for this other application here, I think it's things are a little bit more accurate. It's just, if you just take the pairwise distances between the sensor network and something on a, in a two-dimensional um, domain, we're setting up this system. I think you can show that just because um, the, um, the dimension of these sensor is two, you can just solve some mathematical equations to prove that this is a region. So I don't know if it's exactly two or some multiple of two or something like this, but um, that that's just coming from the fact that you that you constraining the vectors very much, and of course you can ask the, the question why is it low rank, but then you just set up it. But yeah, but for the left thing, of course you you can't don't have a precise model of what it, what makes the viewing profile. So then, in some sense, a combination of heuristics of saying like it might make sense to consider low rank because of having different factors, and and then you're just testing it. Other questions. Maybe I can look in the online audience. Yeah, but move your mouse, move your mouse over the top bar. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Nothing in the chat. Okay, there's nothing in the chat. Then it's um, it's going. So the. Work. Um, and this was motivating this, uh, the first results. There were a um, number of different papers studying this, um, and they were often of uh, this form here. One of them that said, um, we, we are. Um, this, we are taking a, this model that we just described. We sample M of entries according to this model's I at random. And then um, we're having an assumption that the number of entries that we're observing scales like the product of the dimension, the maximum of the two dimensions of the matrix, and the ring. And some logarithmic factors. And then one can show that indeed the minimal nuclear norm minimization has a unique solution and it, 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 which is infected. 
So, right? Yeah, that's something that I think I skipped over. We just assume this for plus or plus of gender. You are asking you. Right? Here we assume uniform. Yes. Yes, I ID uh, uniform. And um, so what you can show is that the information theoretic lower bound would somehow uh, be and this is something similar just with one logarithmic factor. And I think this is also what some people have thought about. So it's, maybe, it's very near optimal so that, uh, that you get, need to get something like the dimension times the rank is, I think it's just clear from counting parameters. And then this log is just from um, some coupon collectors type approach where you're saying that, um, yeah, yeah, otherwise it could happen that we don't observe it that I will always see. And um, yeah, so how does the, did the proof work with these results? And um, the, the main idea is that we first look at the space of ranking R matrix. So we, the tangent space of the rank R matrices here would be somehow of them. Um, I think that yes, the star should be superscript. So it's basically thinking of the product rule. We're having this u naught times sigma naught times v naught. And if we sort of making a small perturbation to this product, we could either make uh, do it on u naught or on v naught. And in the one case, we get u naught times a. And in the other case, we have e star times v naught. Uh, and so. That's why and then we can actually have an exact formula of how this projection looks like. And with that in mind, um, we can look at the dual problem. So think about we can think about these duality problems. I think here, here we have strong duality. Which basically means that um, if uh, x naught is in fact a true solution, if such the, the corresponding parameters are the solution of the dual problem, and this, this corresponding parameters would be what is called a dual certificate here, and so we are asking what would this mean in terms of this dual certificate, and this. Um, this dual certificate needs to satisfy two things. It are uh, three things actually. So it, it first needs to be in uh, the image space of a joint. So thinking about what are the measurements, we're just observing things at random. And um, the adjoint operator would just take um, some entries of the, at, at these observed positions and then complete the matrix by zeros. So we just basically say, Y needs to have the same support as our random, randomly observed entries. And then if you project it on this tangent space that I have just introduced, we get um, U naught, V naught star. So basically the singular value decomposition with just the singular values replaced by one. And then if you're projecting it onto the orthogonal, of this tangent space, then we just need something that's really less than So that's um, sort of just uh, coming directly from duality at this point. And so if you don't know this and you just want to envision this, so you can see this as a, as a non-smooth variant of Lagrange multiplier. So in, if we have Lagrange multiplier equations, then this corresponds basically to this, this first equation, PT of Y is U naught equals as V naught. Um, but this is sort of the, the tangent space is, is the, it's the directions where you can smoothly differentiate. So where smooth theory of Lagrange multipliers just applies. And then for the second, you say, okay, whenever you have a test, 
then it, 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 the directions where it's non-smooth, you know that the derivatives are somehow between negative one and one in this so, um, condition indicates something. So that's that's sort of the natural way the natural perspective, but that, that posed some challenges because especially of this equality things, because if you want to have the all these random conditions, you want to have two things with high probability, but then we typically have concentration, and concentration is never giving you something exact like this. It, it always says that you have something that concentrates around a certain value. So what people did instead, this was, I think, the main uh, contribution of David Gross to this problem, was saying, okay, maybe we can um, relax this equality condition a little bit, as you not you not start, and then at this at the expense of making the other condition a little strong. And indeed, um, that motivated the definition here of the approximate rule certificate. You can see that on the left hand side, you know, the equality only approximately, and then at the same time on the right hand side, it's not just strictly less than one, but strictly less than one half, which is quantitatively less. That because you had this, these are both concentration type uh, inequalities. That's why we have a chance of applying, applying some probabilistic techniques via the so called golfing scheme. But I, the important thing to note is um, that what, what, when does this um, when is this useful? Right? So um, basically, what we what we can say is this is this first condition is some type of a perturbation of this, and this basically makes sense if we have some type of continuity. Because if we do a small perturbation, it completely blows up and changes the pictures. Then these conditions, the equality condition and this uh, um, inequality condition will also be very different. So the question is, what are these assumptions that this can happen? And one of the assumptions here is the so-called uh, restricted isometry properties. So we want this near isometric on T. So thinking about this first thing is, is some type of perturbation on T of this equality constraint that we had before. So that's why we don't need any isometry everywhere, which cannot be true for the measurement operator, but we can, on this tangent space, we can have this. And this is what's given by this condition here. Um, the measurement operator A applied to X will just change the norm by factor of one plus this process. And then um, once we have this, um, you can actually show that this approximate dual certificate solve the problem. But um, then if we come back and think back on, about the exact dual certificate, then sort of things change a little bit because you can say this exact dual, dual certificate, that's sort of the, the principles of strong duality, this is an if and only if condition. So it shouldn't come as a surprise. So we have now this approximate dual certificate as a perturbation of an exact certificate showing that it in, in, in induces recovery. But if it induces recovery, then also there must be an exact dual certificate. And I think that is something in, in, in some way that's um, not very surprising. I think it all makes sense when I say it. But the important thing that we have established here in this, this proposition is that we can also quantify the, like give an ex explicit construction of this uh, exact dual certificate and quantify its size. So in particular, um, we can show something about, um, so when we have, that's the, the upper pos position has this, when we have this um, exact, this approximate dual certificate with one with with some uh, perturbation parameter and one of these um, I think the second thing should also be P -ter T perp sorry for that and then we get 
also an executive certificate with just um, slightly worse. TPEP condition, which is still uh, a lot on, under the assumption that we would finish it. And this will be useful because for the proofs that we will see later on, we, we use the second type of condition on executive certificate so that we got that money. So in some sense, we can repurpose the results in the literature on the approximate dual certificate, but also wanted to do bounds for executive. And then um, this restricted isometry property, I think this was one of the tools that they were using in, on all these papers, so we could just take the literature that it holds. And um, why, so then something else that we need is um, that these exact dual certificate that we're constructing this way, they are actually bounded in the norm, and the norm here is square root. And we have this construction, basically, um, starting with these approximate dual certificate, then blowing them up to an exact dual certificate, perturbing them to an exact dual certificate, and we know um, the, our assumption was for an exact dual certificates that it's in the range of the star. And so we can ask the question, so what's the norm of this vector that we're putting in this vector Z that we're placing in these positions that are sampled and this is true. Okay, so this was the, how the matrix completion problem was solved. And then um, this is sort of the opposite direction where we say that this was something that was used for matrix recovery problems in motion measurements or something like this, where people had the, this was a dual view that I've just presented to you. And now this is the primal view. So it's some sense that, that is, I think that also some of you may be familiar with, where people have been looking at the descent form. So you have your, your solution X naught that you are, um, that, that you want to find somehow. And then you're looking at um, all the perturbations that have smaller nuclear norm. Because we solve it, we're doing nuclear norm minimization. So the solution that we're having needs to, like we know that the, the true solution is, is admissible. So the nuclear norm uh, of this solution that we're finding needs to be small. So we can look at the cone, all the objects. And the norm and it's actually we have to be very careful it's not the core of all the objects but the core of all, all the directions in which there is an object that's a smaller nuclear so there is some epsilon naught some step size that you can go in this direction and get something nuclear it does not mean that if you continue in this direction it will always have small have a nonlinear object. So now let's see how this helps us to consider this descent cone. If we um, look at this x naught plus epsilon z, so a small step in this direction, we can say um, um, when is it admissible? So it needs to satisfy the measurement constraints. So basically, eps this epsilon z perturbation cannot change the measurements, or in other words, it's in the kernel of the measurement. And so that's why you can say, if you want to ask me when is the minimizing peak, you're taking this kernel of the measurement operator and you're intersecting it with the descent cone that I have just designed. If that's just a unique solution, and that means there is no object with smaller nuclear model. Um, is satisfying the measurement. This is how it looks like. We could have something. This is the red, the dark red thing is all the objects with smaller nuclear on this, this plane would be um, um, only the vectors that are satisfying the measurement constraint. And then you're looking at the But um, this is sort of the setup 
or, or how people have been studying this problem. So these are two different ways to study the same problem. This, I think, has never been really used for matrix completion. And um, it's just mainly for Gaussian um, measurements. This final viewpoint, for example, is, is very powerful and gives you optimal results. And in particular, this uh, for the Gaussian measurements, um, it, it also allows you to deal with noise in this. So let's see what noise would mean in this context. There's basically two things that could happen. You have the, the measurement A of X naught plus E, where E could either be random, you choose it according to some distribution, for example, Gaussian, or it could be adversarial. The sense that I'm telling you, um, you can do any perturbation. Here are the measurements, and you can do the perturbations that are worst uh, for the reconstruction. So you know the reconstruction algorithm, you know the measurement, you know anything, do what you can. The only constraint that I'm giving you is the perturbation that you know is small. This is something that I think has been receiving attention, for example, also in the, in the machine learning. And there's also machine learning problem, but in other machine learning problems where, uh, where sort of for classification has been shown that small, very, very tiny perturbations can really fool the classifier limit. So here we have a possible, we don't have a classification problem, but but still um, we we could see how oh, can this classifier or this this um, matrix completion I will be fooled by a small perturbation. So, um, how would we solve it here? So the, the natural thing is okay. If we don't, if we just solve this problem that we had before, the true solution would not even be feasible, right? So that's why we have to relax it a little bit. And the natural way is that we say, okay, if we know that our uh, noise has the size tau, then we just admit all perturbations. We have we say we have to be most tau away from the true measurements, then um then our means our true solution is admissible. It's sort of it's just in, in the edge of what is so um this is what we're doing and, and this already in case that i couldn't pick this up that we are focusing on the second example instead so that this the, the point of adversarial so what what can we say so, and so we could um, the question that we want to ask is, is matrix completion robust to adversarial? In other words, can we establish effective stability in the reconstruction? So noise. And um, for this matrix sensing, I told you like when you have Gaussian measurements of the matrix, I told you already that this primal approach is very powerful also to noise. And so what you get is indeed here. So let me just say again when I say Gaussian measurements, I'm just taking I'm just saying we're taking the entire matrix and doing an entry, like we sort of expanding it as a very long vector and then applying it by huge, uh, multiplying it by huge Gaussian matrix. So you basically don't um, observe, you just uh, don't have any structure in the measurements whatsoever. And um, then indeed you don't even need log factors. You just have the, the degrees of freedom R times N and um, you get a reconstruction that is on the order, the reconstruction error is, is, is on the order of the noise. In some sense that's also optimal. Yes. And um, is the maximum of the Thanks for asking. And so we basically, when we started working on this topic, we saw this result and said, like, this is so such a great thing. And, and we want to know what happens. In, like, we want to have something like that for matrix computers. And then we can go to literature. And you can see, uh, maybe it's there already, because there's this result from 15 years ago that um, studies that I think. There's more lag factors, but maybe we can work on this. But the point is that what they find you can work with adversarial noise of the type that I've described, and the reconstruction error is indeed like you can see here your tau 
And when tau goes to zero, the error goes to zero, and this is basically driving you back to the consumer. But as you can also see, there is this strange factor of square root of n1. Basically, um, why would this dimension, like previously result, we had this, um, this tau, the scaling is somehow adapted. As I said, that's the point. We have the scaling is adapted that we we have uh, the, the relative error would just be um, preserved if we had tau on the right hand side. So why does this result um, this additional dimension? Um, so is this an artifact of the proof techniques? I mean, this was what we started off thinking because the golfing scheme that I had sort of the, the, the Thinking about uh, uh, dual certificates, they are always centered at a particular point. So if, if you are sort of moving away from this point, then things may maybe be altered in a suboptimal way. Because in particular, if you do experiments, then it seems to work better. And if you have random noise, there's also theory that shows that it's that it's better that there shouldn't be this dimension factor. So why um, do we have it here in the episode? That was sort of the start. And I can first uh, result that I have brought with you here, with me here, is that indeed it needs to be there. And let me walk you through it and explain you why. I will say some words. So, first of all, we should see um, that the number of measurements here are in the regime that we are. Um, Considering so, we are somehow we have some upper constraints, so we don't want the measurements to be very, very large. So that it's sort of a small, like like it's a constant fraction of the entire matrix is not what we want. We're looking at a small rank, and we want a, number, a measurement that is sort of maybe scaling. You think about the what we had before, rank times dimension, maybe times log vectors, maybe a little bit more. Than and then let's see what we would need for a counter so I would say, say the counter example would mean we have our true solution here and then there's an alternative solution that has the potential of fooling us so what would this mean what would fooling us mean so the first thing if it's fooling us it should better be feasible right because otherwise we will throw it out immediately so it should that this x tilt, this, this alternative solution should be a x tilt should be close to y for this tau that we have defined now. At the same time, it should be preferred because we are doing a nuclear norm minimization. So if it has larger nuclear norm than the truth, then we will never select it. And also it has, doesn't have a potential to be. And then we still need this thing that corresponds to violating the theory. So we need to say, even though the measurements are closed, they are bound by tau here, the matrix and um, this alternative are a little bit uh, somewhat further away. Here, this is what it's written here. So it's tau, it's lower bounded, this difference by tau times this. R times n1 and 2 divided by so this is not the square root of n that we have seen, but let's have a look. I think it's um did I omit it. Yeah, I think sorry, I, I think I omitted this. Um because um in the slide, so let me just say why is this a good property? So if we're thinking in the competitive regime, we had that number of measurements m is r times n times log factors. Plug this in, then up, then r times n cancels. The log factors are still there. We don't care about these in the first approximation. And what's left is exactly this order. So in some sense, this is what we're looking for. I should, however, before I receive the um, 
I should, however, um, state that there's a, there's a small caveat. It doesn't show that really the, the solution of the nuclear normal emergency is unstable, because what it, it, what, what it allows is the following scenario. You have the true solution here, and you have your alternative solution, which is far away and, and has a smaller nuclear norm. And then you have a third solution, which is again close to the true solution, which is even smaller. So this is this is possible by this reason. But at the same time, I think you can argue, so we don't say anything about the solution of the nuclear norm minimizer, but I think we're so talking, we're saying something about the conditioning of the problem. So you certainly don't want, like even if the true solution is, is good, but there's multiple um, things with very, very close, uh, that are feasible with very, very close nuclear norms floating around, then for numerical reasons, and, and you, are going to, you, don't, you certainly don't want this. This is not our, our viewpoint of what we think about sort of uniqueness in, this, in this more stable way. So I think, that's what we, so with I should say that this is there's this, this small limitations and it would sort of for theoretical interest it would be interesting what the if there is this alternative truth solution or like good solution or not but I think sort of for saying whether the problem is useful or something it's a good and then in this uh, first paper where with Dominic we has also established some bounds for rank one. Um, matrices, and then um, I think I, I don't have to walk you through this um, exactly. It just basically says that um, if the noise level is not too small, in the case of rank one, you can um, get some type of construction. So you, that is better. So basically, there's a maximum. So there's there's a noise level. So if you're above a certain noise level, it does okay. But it's only um, it's only sort of for this large noise scenario. It's only for rank one, and it's sort of somewhat restricted. You would like to understand the small noise scenario. You would also uh, understand the case that the matrices are rank R. So, but but still, the fact that something better is possible, you can see here from the geometric intuition given in this picture, namely this. Uh, what the idea is that if this, this red curve would indicate the nuclear norm ball, that maybe the picture is more previously we were looking at cones. The box that I said earlier, when we studied these, these problems, we were looking at the descent cone. And we we're asking how were things, uh, um, how, how, what's the size of the cone intersect with certain abilities. But if you have a, a parabolic set like this, or a, a rounded tangent set like this, then a conic approximation is not very good. So here you can see, if you just approximate this thing by a cone, then maybe you have this purple object, which is a very wide and large cone. Whereas if you are just saying, I want an approximation of the, uh, this, this parabola outside of a certain band, then you can see that this green cone, like everything that is outside of this uh, shaded, yellow shaded region is captured by this green cone. So that means once, once we are willing to say that the noise needs to be above a certain level, then we are um, getting a much smaller cone. So that was the this geometric intuition that, we, that led us to these better bounds. But the Geometric the, the follow up or the um the that we have, that I would like to present you in the last ten minutes is um sort of by, motivated by the um, idea of saying like okay if we have a, an object that looks like a parabola why are we doing why do we want to approximate it from the first place? even if we are sort of restricting uh, outside a certain band then it may be feasible. But maybe if we have an object that looks like a parabola, maybe we want to approximate it by a parabola. And um, that's indeed what we have out here. And um, 
because we have a parabola that I will look down here, that um, that's a, it's a very complicated looking result, but I will point out the important things. So the, the most important thing, like the first thing is that we have some type of measurements here. We have the, the model is exactly the same as before, but now um, previously we we're asking what is the constant times tau that I that I uh, that describes the number of measure that, that describes the um, reconstruction error, and we had this negative result saying the constant times tau that I need needs to be very large if I have a now. Let's say okay, maybe the times tau is the problem. So let's do square root of tau. So if we have square root of tau, um, which then which is still going to zero when tau goes to zero, but then we can have a prefactor that only depends on um, the rank and on logarithmic on the dimension. It doesn't have these dimension factors that were necessary. And it also doesn't violate the other thing because when tau goes to zero, it's closer and closer to zero. Um, tau and square root of tau are uh, as far apart as you like, right? So you can get a very large constant uh, that describes the relations between tau and square. So that's why in this type of results here, we have the chance to do without this dimension. So you can also say, okay, but the scaling maybe doesn't work because if you have you have square root of tau, tau it sort of has a different dimensionality. And for that reason, we have this um, nuclear norm factor. Compensate um, the difference between tau. Tau and entering the noise level on the noise term and the fact that we have the square root of the So, like I, I think I will say something about the assumptions um, in a second. So let me just pick out the the because we have this max here. Let's pick out the small and the large regime to to, to really explain max, which basically says that in the small regime we have the square root of tau scaling that I just described, and then at some point the square root of tau gets better than tau. We can we know that we can't do better. Than so that means for this very large noise level, we were supposed to be. Right? And that's, that's sort of the idea. And then there's this parameter alpha. This defines a trade off between sampling complexity and complexity. So let's look at where, where it appears. So here, alpha is between zero and five over two. Let's have a look what happens in these two cases. So in the case of zero, we have a sampling complexity that has additional factors of R, but have a prefactor here in this, this noise robustness or that only has R to the one half times log two. So that means that we are, yes, there's some R dependence, but it's very, uh, very small. So this is the case where we actually know so that, that the square root of R is significantly better than having the square root of the dimension entering the picture. And then the other extreme would be that you have alpha equals five over two. Then you're getting the near optimal up to this, like this one log factor, but basically the near optimal sampling complexity of R times N times some log factors. But the price that you pay is that you put more R factors in, in this. Uh, you can still no square root of n factors if r is small. This is still giving us a better one. Yeah, so let's um, just take five minutes to just point out some key ideas of the group. The, um, the first is like, okay, we, we will just restrict everything to square. And we also assume that we have a case of emission, otherwise we do some type of lift into it. And then, um, then we are um, 
looking at the minimizer of the noisy and semi problem that I've described to you. And so again, we, we take the primal perspective. And I have introduced you earlier the primal of the dual perspective. We start off with the primal perspective. So we said X, and we have a small one well, because we have the, the minimizer needs to be true solution plus some perturbation that's in the descent. Let's see what, what this entails for the reconstruction error. The reconstruction error is um, basically epsilon because we, the descent cone will normalize this object Z to one. So when we're just pulling this out here, then basically this is Z equals one, then the X naught cancels. So we just have epsilon times something with norm one. So the reconstruction error will just be S. And at the same time, the error of the output, you can just do the same thing here. It's epsilon. So basically, we want to see how these two things compare to each other. It's really about estimating the of the two. And then we have some additional things that this thing here is um, bound by two tau by um, by the things the trying inequality combined with the measurement constraints, they both sort of they both tau away from two measurements, so they two tau away from each other, and um, so you can put things into perspective and and um, relate this here, and so so we have that x minus x star is two tau divided by the that's basically why we want to um, control A of Z in the tree. And so that's where the connection, because it's in the denominator, the question is how small in this A of Z? This is when we get to the conic singular values, because this is exactly the smallest that a of Z can get Z being in the central. Here, so again, if we have lower bounds on this, we can say this is the double guarantees that's known from this result for Gaussian measurements. But here, we would like to look at this A of Z in the This is what we want to estimate. Right. Let's go about this. And this is sort of the, the key um, observation. So the first thing is if we have a two norm, and now we're looking for a lower bound. So we can use the, the dual definition that it's the um, the, the two norm is the product, the supremum of all the products with vectors of norm one. So if we want to take a lower bound, we can just um any x, plug it in and see what we do. And now this, but the, I think that, that's something, an idea that I have to credit to Dominic at the time. That uh, this is uh, sort of the, the idea, okay, let's, if we don't, if we can choose what we want, and we have this duality that sort of, that corresponds to things flipping over from, from one side to the other, maybe, this X that a good candidate for this X that has a good chance of giving us something reasonable is exactly this dual situation. And I'm um, so cool. let's just recall what it was. Um, the dual certificate um, had these two conditions here, like what we established that um, its projection on the tangent space of the low rank matrices is U naught V naught star. The sort of the, the singular value decomposition without the singular with the singular values replaced by one, and then the projection on the orthogonal of the tangent space. We then addition what we had in this lemma established previously, that is also we can bound it by the square root 
this R log N, which is exactly where the square root R log N factor, that sort of unavoidable in the bound that I'm showing you is coming. So I think um, this is uh, a nice observation. So now let's try to see, let's take this and we're plugging in. So we're not plugging in the, um, we're not plugging in Y, Y is a matrix. So we can't really plug it into here. Here we need a vector to plug in. So we, we know that this Y comes from Z, right? Y is A star of Z. And so we're plugging in that particular choice. So let's see what we get. So this is, would be Z prime in this case, our, our choice of the rule certificate. So let's plug it in, Z prime divided by its norm. And now um, we can bound the norm by square of R log N. This is what we've just established. And we have the A that's sitting now with the Z, capital Z here. This is what we wanted to bound. And now we can push it over to the others. This is where we get in the regime. So then now we have A stars. Now we can use all the things that we know about this. Why? So let's see what, what it is. A star Z prime is now Y prime. And um, so this is the work we So this is the, the true situation. So this is this is sort of, I think the, the key proof idea that, that we conveyed to you. And I'll just be very brief as you see the slides and just doing the rest of the proofs. First of all, now is Y prime and Z. You can split into the components parallel and orthogonal to T. And this is where we have some knowledge on how Y behaves. And um So, um, because this is where we, we know exactly how this dual certificate behaves from the two. Then, now, this is sort of the, the main idea. This is sort of where things have become very nice and elegant. But now, um, we have to, in order to continue the bounds, um, we have to, it's becoming a little bit tedious. We have to um, first have this Z that we split in here, this D part, and we have to split the into the part that has a zero trace. And then because uh, the zero trace somehow doesn't contribute to some of the some of the factors that we've seen, and then it somehow depends how far. We're taking this PSD part, how large or how small it is with respect to the zero trace part. This is something else. we don't have the time to go into the technical details, but um, this is where we distinguish the two cases, and this is where we get the freedom of alpha. So it depends where we draw the line between the large, sort of between a large. Is the part in terms of as compared to the zero trace part or a small. So this is this is where this R to the alpha comes from. So you could either make this draw this line for a, a small number. So basically making the one class more restrictive, the, the uh, one case more restrictive, the other case larger, that will give you a higher sampling complexity that you need. Or you could make the second case more restrictive, the first case larger. This will give you a worse performance with this um, with this noise resistance. So that's sort of the well, this is where the trade-off is coming from that we had in the theorem coming from this, this division. So that, as I said, unfortunately, I mean, I'm already a few minutes over time, so I can't go into the details of this. But I, I would just like to summarize that what I've shown you provides a description of the reconstruction instability for small noise levels when tau is small, basically. We have a squared dependence so that the relative error that we've seen 
and more or less we have like one over square root of tau. And that is, that's how we can balance this impossibility result that we've shown in one of the theorem with the fact that still things go to zero nicely. Zero without having additional dimensional points. Of course, we can ask the question, how can the scaling be improved? And also ask the question that I sketched upon what happens um, with the true minimizer. Maybe there's, there's just this alternative solution of the true minimizer is again good. There are a lot of interesting questions being addressed. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Here are some additional references. I welcome any questions.